starting in verse 29. If you know that He is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. Amen. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Let your steadfast love come to us, O oh Lord. Your salvation according to your promise. Then shall we have an answer for him who taunts us, for we trust in your word. Give us to give to us, Lord, we pray the grace to trust in your word, that we might receive it, and that it might dwell in us richly, we ask, for Jesus' name's sake. Amen. Some years ago, a group of German researchers studied the cries of 60 healthy babies. The babies were born to French-speaking as well as German-speaking parents. And the researchers found that babies cry in their mother's tongue. Uh, they documented, for example, that French babies cry with a, a rising accent, whereas German babies will cry with a falling inflection. Dr. Kathleen Wernke, who, who led the research team, said this, the finding of this study is that not only are human neonates, babies, capable of producing different cry melodies, but they prefer to produce those melody patterns that are typical for the ambient language they have heard during their fetal life. Well, it's no revelation is it that children resemble or take after their parents uh, if you saw my dad at church last Sunday morning I need say no more uh, but the truth is that it the same is true for God's children that God's children resemble him we continue our series in the in the letter known as 1 John today, and the point of our passage is this, everyone who practices righteousness has been born of God. Look at 1 John 2 verse 29, uh, there John writes, if you know that he, God is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. That in other words, since God is righteous, righteousness is the family trait that gives us all away. But, but before we come to our, our text today, we need to ask, why did John think it necessary to make that point at all? Well, hopefully you'll, you'll remember that John wrote this letter to give true believers assurance of their salvation. A group had left the churches to whom John, had, uh, to, to whom John wrote to go after a false Christ, and yet their lives proved that they didn't know the true Christ at all. And so that's why scattered throughout this short and yet loaded letter are these tests of faith, these ways and means of analyzing a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so far, John has given to us, you remember, a, a moral test. He said, true believers keep Jesus' commandments. And then John gave us a, a social test where he said, true believers love one another. 
And then John gave us a, a doctrinal test where he said, true believers believe the truth about Jesus. And in chapter 2, verse 29, John begins a second moral test. Those who had left, they were known for their immoral lives. And so John wanted his readers to know that for all of their talk about new revelation and about special knowledge that they and they alone were receiving, they had no share in Christ at all. And so again, he makes the point in verse 29, everyone who practices righteousness has been born of God. But what I love about this passage is that John actually interrupts himself for three verses. It's amazing because immediately after he writes the words, born of God, he finds himself overcome at the thought of being God's children. And so the moral test that begins in verse 29 gets picked up in verse 4 that we're going to look at next Sunday morning, Lord willing. This sermon will be a whole message on a parenthesis. And John's going to speak to us today about number one, the wonder of being God's children. And number two, our hope as God's children. And before we get into it, I need to say this to us today, friends, unless we know that we really are God's true, cherished children, our Christianity will always be in, in the theoretical level. Unless we know ourselves to be the true children of God, cherished by Him, Loved by him, we will never walk in the good of all that is ours in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to know that we are, in fact, his true beloved children. And so for the sake, then, of our joy as believers, friends, let us decide right now, before we come to our verses, to yield our hearts to all that John will have to say to us today. My responsibility will be to wring this passage out for all of the encouragement that it has. Your responsibility will be to drink it in. And may God give us the grace to do that for our joy and for his glory. A few Sundays ago, I I quoted Dr. J.I. Packer from his book, Knowing God. If you haven't read that book, Buy it, read it, and thank me later. And J.R. Packer writes this in that book. He says, what is a Christian? The question can be answered in many ways. But the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as father. Later he writes this. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ taught, everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, Everything that is distinctively Christian as opposed to merely Jewish is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Father, he writes, is the Christian name for God. So may John's encouragement then today wrestle your doubts to the ground and lift you to new heights of joy as we leave this place to the praise of God's glory. Everyone who practices righteousness, has been born of God. And so we're going to see, first of all then, the wonder of being God's children. The wonder of being God's children. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. John writes this, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Please give me permission to read that verse again. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. 
And so the reason then that, that John interrupts the, the moral test that he began in verse 29 is because he was in awe of God's adopting love. In awe of the love that caused us to be born of God. In fact, fascinatingly, the, the Greek word uh, behind the words in our English translation, what kind of, there in verse 1, is the Greek word potapen. And it means of what country. So if you, if you lived in a town like Hoylake back in the first century and you saw foreign ships sailing in to shore, you would ask, Potapen, that is, of what country are these visitors from? And the point then is that God's love that caused us to be born of him was altogether out of this world. Altogether foreign. Otherworldly. Because in our, in our world, this is the way that love works. We love the people who love us. But God lavished his love, it lavished his love on us when we were fighting him. God covered us with his love when we had covered our ears to his voice. And God shone his love on our hearts when we had hardened our hearts toward him. That was when God foreknew us. That was when God in love predestined us. That was when God forgave us and justified us and then miraculously adopted us into his family. So that now, not only are we called the children of God, but we actually are the children of God. It's who we are, not just by name, but by nature. So that now royal robes cover us and royal blood flows through us. And since that really is who we are, down to our very DNA, that's why we are now strangers to the world. Look at the end of verse 1. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him, Christ. That in other words, since the world didn't recognize Jesus as God's Son, so now the world doesn't recognize us as God's sons and daughters. That is how profound the change that God wrought within us really was. It remade us from the inside out. But you know what? I am convinced that many Christians don't know themselves to be God's true children either. It's not just that we're strangers to the world. It's sometimes that we're strangers to our own identities as the sons and the daughters of God. Yes, they know it theoretically. Yes, they know it doctrinally. But rarely do they actually feel like a beloved child of God. And if that's you here today, perhaps uh, that's because you, are, you, you think so much more about your deficiencies than you do about God's mercies toward you in Christ. But instead of you taking 10 looks at Christ for every one look within, you take 10 looks within for every one look at Christ. Or, or, or perhaps it's because you, you don't want to be like those Christians. Uh, th those Christians who, who seem to so easily take God's love for granted, but then don't seem to actually fear God. Or, or, or reverence God or, or tremble before Him. And so you, you shy away from, from reveling in God's personal love for you because you don't want to get off balance or just become plain weird. But look at me. If you are here today and you are a Christian, you are more loved than you ever dreamed. I want to say that again. If you are here today and you are, not a, and you are a Christian, you are more loved as a child of God than you ever dreamed dreamed more than you thought possible in fact your ability to comprehend God's love for you is like trying to measure the Atlantic Ocean using only a teaspoon the breadth of it the length of it 
the height of it, the depth of it, far exceeds our soul's measuring apparatus. You are a cherished child of God. Don't shy away from it. Pry into it. In fact, that is exactly what God's word commands you to do in this very passage here today. The first word in our text is what? See. As in, come on now, look at this. Pry into this. Put it under the microscope, or rather I should say the telescope. Make the massive love of God for you look more like it. It really is. Behold it, John says. Survey it. Look into it. Study it. And how can we do that? Well, we can do that by visiting the place where God's love for us was demonstrated. The love of God that caused us to be born of Him was no hidden love, no private love. Rather, it was put on display for the world to see at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is where we see it. There is where we can behold it. That there God rejected His only begotten Son that He may receive us. And there God the Father abandoned His Son that He may adopt us into His family for all eternity. And again, if you want to see the love of God for you, you've got to visit the place where He displayed it for all to see. And you must do it often. Now listen, I I know that upon saying that, some of you are thinking to yourselves, yeah, Hugh, I've done that though. I've done that and it doesn't work. I've done that and I feel as lifeless as I did before. Preaching the gospel to myself doesn't work. And to you, I want to say, not so fast. Not so fast. Have you ever heard a, a tourist say something utterly ridiculous? Like, yeah, we did Europe on Friday and Saturday. You, you, you sort of just want to say, okay, l- listen, mate, just because you ate five croissants in Paris and saw the Eiffel Tower doesn't mean to say you did Europe. You didn't even do Paris. In fact, you could spend a year in London And know 5% of it relatively well. It's always Americans in it that talk like that. Well, friends, how much more the metropolis of God's love for you in the gospel. Don't tell me you've done the gospel. Don't tell me you've preached the gospel to yourself and it doesn't work. There is infinitely more to it than our eyes and our hearts can fully comprehend and think about this if we are going to be singing about the lamb that was slain throughout all of eternity don't tell me you have exhausted it because you've been thinking about it for 60 years there is more to the love of God in Christ for you than all that you have been able to understand thus far and that would be true even if you were to live a thousand lifetimes There is always more of God's love for you to see at the cross of Christ. And so again, if you want to see what kind of love the Father has given to us, look to the place where it was displayed for you, the cross of Calvary. And see from His head, His hands, His feet, sorrow and love flow mingle down. And ask yourself, did e'er such love or sorrow meet or thorns compose? so rich a crown. But then on the other hand, if you want to experience this great love of God afresh, this love of God that caused us to be born of Him, you must also, on the other hand, forsake everything that grieves the heart of the one that adopted you. You see, just because you can't lose your salvation doesn't mean to say you won't lose the joy of your salvation. And that's exactly what you'll do if you consistently and persistently grieve the heart of the Father who adopted you. So seriously, delete the app that numbs your soul to the love of God. Stop flirting with that person at work. 
Stop stealing from your employer. I don't care that anyone else or everyone else in the office is doing it. End the relationship that dishonors God. And speak the truth to one another. Stop lying to one another. Crucify your ego in the knowledge that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And having turned from your sin afresh, turn back to the Father who stands with open arms, ready to receive you, ready to forgive you, ready to pour out on you another experience of his great love for you. And so we've thought, first of all, then about the wonder of being God's children. But next, we're going to see our hope is God's children. Our hope is God's children. Back in, in 1993, the band Pearl Jam released their, their second studio album. And within five days, it had, it had sold 950,000 copies. And Eddie Vedder, the, the band's lead singer, was on the front of all of these magazines at the time. But he said this, I'm being honest. When I say, sometimes when I see a picture of the band or a picture of my face taking up a whole page of a magazine, I hate that guy. And there are times, aren't there, in your life, there are times in my life when we know just how he feels. Our minds can be taken up with the things of earth and not on the things of heaven. And our souls don't feel the way we We want them to feel when we open God's word, when we pray and when we stand to sing in in public worship. In fact, there are times when we are aghast that our souls don't feel anything at all. And we as husbands know, don't we, that our, our love for our wives falls far short of Christ's love for the church. And as parents, sometimes we do grieve and we do provoke our children. To anger. Sometimes we are far too stern, other times we are not stern enough or firm enough. And instead of our feet on a Sunday morning making a a beeline for the most vulnerable people in the church, they they tend to, to gravitate to the people that like us the most. And we're not as bold in our evangelism as we as we want to be. And we're disappointed with ourselves, aren't we? And and it's because the Apostle John, the the great Apostle of love, knew that as believers we we, we can often feel like failures or or like losers, that he he grabs us by our shoulders in verse 2. And he looks us in the eye and he says to us, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And there's our hope as God's children. That soon, very soon, we will be made like Christ. You see, beholding is becoming. And what we admire is so often what we embody. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Well, if that is true here and now, then how much more then and there? Seeing Jesus face to face in the fullness of his manifest glory, no longer concealed, but on display for us to see. That's when we'll be blameless as he is blameless. And that is when we will be pure as he is pure. And then we will love God as Jesus loved the Father. And that is when we will love one another as Jesus loved us. And so the next time you are floored by a sense of your deficiencies or inadequacies or failures or sins, tell yourself this, this won't be forever. This won't be forever. One day... I will be just like Jesus. E.V. Hill was a a preacher in the U.S. for most of the 20th century. And the church that he served hired a a secretary to to work full time, helping him out. Uh, All he knew about this girl was that her name was Natalie. 
And, and one day one of the church members said to him, do you know who your secretary is? And he said, of course, Natalie is her name, Natalie Cole. And the church member replied, but do you know who Natalie Cole is? Of course, he said, she's a very nice young lady who works very well and we pay her $2 an hour. Apparently, this was a while ago, hopefully. Uh, the member said, that's Nat King Cole's daughter. The preacher asked Cole to come into his study and he asked her if that was true. She said, yes. Why didn't you tell me then? He asked. She said, I didn't know that was required for the job. My dad left me something, but I haven't come into it yet. And it won't be mine until I'm 21 years old. Well, if at any point before her 21st birthday, she became bothered about monotonous or boring work, she could tell herself, this won't be forever. And again, there's our hope as God's children. That the next time we're, we're fed up with trying to wrestle that indwelling sin to the ground again. And sometimes when it feels like the, a, a bar of soap in the bath or something like that, you get it here, but then it just flies off somewhere else. What do we need to know? We need to know this won't be forever. And one day I'm going to be like Jesus himself. And I'll love God just as he loved God. And I'll love others just like he loved me too. But you see in the passage that this future hope has a pre present benefit as well. Chapter 3, verse 3. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. You see that there's more than just this won't be forever. Rather, as we anticipate Christ's transfor Christ transforming us then, we will be transformed now. Because the anticipation of that day will wean us off worldly joys. So friends, let's make sure that our future hope purifies us from all grumbling, for example. Because think about it, how can we grumble when we have a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul? A hope that enters into the holy place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. I heard a preacher recently say, uh, that when you hear someone with a different accent, what's the first question you ask him or, or ask her? You ask them, where are you from? And he said, in the same way, our speech as citizens of heaven should give us all away. That our speech should tell other people, I don't belong here. I'm a citizen of another world. So really think twice tomorrow about, about grumbling about the things your colleagues grumble about. Think twice before you whine and complain about the things that they whine and complain about. Because if we do that, we'll sound like a people that don't have the hope that John speaks of here. But friends, because we do have this hope, we are to be that people who can weather any storm, who can endure all hardships, and who can even smile in the face of our most determined enemy because we know where our hope lies not in the world below but in the christ who waits to meet us above and i want to close today by speaking to those of you who are here today and are not yet christians so and what i want to say to you today is this your hope is confined to life in this world you have no hope beyond this life and Hebrews 9.27 says it is appointed once for a man to die and after that the judgment. And apart from Christ being for you, you will have no hope in his presence whatsoever. So what are you going to do about that today? I read this past week about a man called uh, Brian Kelly and his doctors told him that he didn't have very long. So he called his family to his bedside and this guy, Brian Kelly, worked at a, a fireworks factory and so he gave his family instructions to roll his ashes into a 12 inch firework his family did what he asked and someone wrote this the firework had two silver streaming comet trails tails that followed in its ascent and then it burst and for four seconds there were green and red stars everywhere intermingled with his ashes 
four seconds of glory, and the show was over. Without Christ, this guy wrote, no matter how long or short a life we live, that is about all of life there is. A few seconds of glory, and then everything flickers and fades into darkness. But those who know Christ will one day be with Jesus and will become like Jesus. And friend, that hope is available to you if you're here today and you're not a Christian. Turn from your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today. The Bible says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Are you a sinner? Yes. Believe on him. The Bible says that Christ died for sinners. Are you a sinner? Yes. Then believe on him. The Bible says that God raised him from the dead to receive all who come to him. Are you a sinner in need of coming to him? Yes. Go to him today and you will be saved. Received by him. Known by him. Loved by him forevermore. And to that we can say amen. I want to pray for us and then we'll stand to our feet and we'll sing together. Let's, let's pray.